This is episode 62 of our road to Unicum, and today we look at the Lorraine 40T. This is a tier 8 French premium medium tank in World of Tanks, and it's an autoloader. So I'm going to talk about how to play an autoloader like the Lorraine 40T in two tier 10 battles, and if you don't own the Lorraine 40T, the concepts I'm going to be talking about are still totally transferable. First thing to note, you know, when loading into a battle, aside from the tier, is to look at how many arties they have. So they do have two arties, and you know that's going to influence where I might do and where I might go. Typically, if you know they're they're arties, I'll go up along the nine lane down to about E9. The main thing is I want to be careful. You know, in some battles, I act even in an auto loader like this tank as the primary spotter, even though that exposes me to some risk, and I'll spot if my team is not doing so properly. But in this kind of battle where there are multiple tier 9 and tier 10 Russian medium tanks on top of their light tanks, I want to be careful and I want to punish this CDC who's moved up very aggressively to try to get into this little area at E6. The thing for me to recognize is my posture is now broken, meaning that CDC can keep me lit and depending on whether how he's poking, I may not have a shot on him. And if he's got me lit, that means that I'm going to be susceptible to fire from the Russian medium tanks, which in particular I want to be careful about because they have such good armor profiles and they have a very high DPM. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that you know if the CDC has shots on me or their other tanks, their, their arties might be in a position if they know where I am to be able to fire and you know, a tank like the Lorraine 40T is very squishy. I'm staying well below that ridge, so the CDC is dead, but I'm still staying well below this middle ridge here on the e legs I don't want to get spotted. We don't know their deployment of some of their tanks. We know that they have, for example, a Rhine metal Borsig in field, but we haven't, you know, maybe spotted all their tanks yet, so you want to be a little bit careful. I do have a full clip here, and I was watching originally to see if I might have shots in their Oho if you cross the E-Lane, but our T95 pushed up, so there wasn't a shot there. Notice on that 430 that his turret wasn't outlined at the time that I fired. It's because there is a destructible brick wall there. So to some extent, you know, you need to know the maps because things like destructible uh, cover, like walls or buildings, destructible buildings, will mask the outline of your opponent. Right. Okay, now check out uh, the positioning on our Skoda T50. So he has been pushing up pretty dangerously. I'll get to this in a minute, but notice that the, the 13105 is moving straight back in a linear line. It makes it very easy to take that snapshot because I can see kind of where he's heading. And it's definitely worth taking him out at that time. Now, our Skoda T50, just to my right, our friendly player, he's making a very common mistake. He is overexposing himself to try to chase damage, but his positioning is terrible. Now he's tracked. Notice he just had a very large alpha hit him. And so even when I look at a player, when you see friendly players die, you can use what's happening to them as data. So for example, the Skoda T50 ate one shell for over 700 alpha. And so what that tells me is that their German TD is running the higher caliber 750 alpha gun. Now I've been withholding the last two shells on my clip. You could definitely argue for as long as I was waiting to get these two shots that I would have been better served had I reloaded and had four shells to work with. But at least thankfully I was able to put those last two shells into that 62A uh, for the kill. So we're doing pretty good here in field. And then, you know, again, while I'm reloading, I'm not making it possible for them to spot me. I don't want to eat any unnecessary damage, and especially in auto loaders, you know, they tend to be below average DPM tanks, but they tend to be very good at bursting enemies. And so, you know, what you want to try to do is deal as much damage as you can throughout the match on a consistent basis. So, you know, that's a general principle with any tank. Keep your gun active. However, you want to conserve your hit points in case later you need to be willing to push on enemies, you know, eat a shot to deliver forward and return. Okay, so... I'm about to poke out along the street along the zero lane. The main thing to, to know is that there's a slight gap between the building and the bush. So as I cross over to that bush to potentially spot, I may get counter spotted. At this point, however, you know, we've got a pretty solid lead, seven to four, so I'm gonna go ahead and risk it here. Okay, I don't see anything. Originally I was thinking, you know, that they might have that light tank up on zero lane, and then I spot their Panther II who's backed up here, and then switch targets over to their light tank. And the main reason why is that light tank can counter spot me or outspot me, whereas I'm not as worried about the Panther II, and then the Udes also get spotted. That was one of the things which I was a little wary about as well. If, if you're facing a Swedish tank destroyer, either the Premium Strip or the Udes or the Tier 9 or Tier 10, those tanks all have fantastic camo values. So, you know, if they're sitting stationary in a bush, you're almost always going to get outspotted by them, especially if, you know, like in my case, if I push out from behind this bush and I don't have any soft cover in front of me, but they're sitting with a bush directly in front of them. 
Okay, at this point, you know, I can go ahead and push up a little bit. That German tank destroyer has been spotted, so I'm going to see if I can get a shot on him. And then that's the idea. What I just I just came out around the corner just as my clip was finished reloading so that I could try to aim in. And then I took one snapshot primarily because I can afford to miss that first shot. In this case, it's okay. You know, if that first shot misses, I can try to get a second shot on him. And moreover, their Panther too took some damage not only from me but from other friendly tanks, so he's pretty beat up. Now, if you're moving, you know, all toward an area, the safest thing that you can do generally to avoid getting spotted is to move directly through the bushes. So notice I'm going in a line directly through the bushes, and so that makes it so that, you know, the Panther 2 and I don't see each other until about the same time. Um, what often happens, you'll see players do, is drive across open ground when they're driving toward opponents that are in soft cover, you know, behind bushes and trees, and you're going to get outspotted most of the time if the opponent is in a tank destroyer, light tank, or a medium tank. That's just how the game works. And so, you know, there's a lot of players who don't understand how to play vision. I see people complaining about vision mechanics or bushes, etc. consistently. I Honestly, the bushes for me tend to behave pretty much exactly as you would expect. Like right here, I'm very intentionally keeping this bush between me and the M103. You know, obviously I can't fire yet because my you know, the clip hasn't finished reloading, and so I'm just getting some spawning damage here. You could you could argue that I'm being too passive, you know, given the situation. We have such a huge lead that I could have kept driving straight toward the M103 so that, you know, by the time my clip was reloaded, I'd have an opportunity to put some shells into him. But, you know, what you saw there was just a, a micro example of the power of having that intervening soft cover, those bushes, especially if you're a tank that has pretty good camo. And so you can see this is by far my most... Uh, skilled crew. I've got three women in it. They're from my bat chat, 25T crew. So uh, I have an unusual number of skills in this crew. You know, as it turns out, you know, I used to spend a lot of the a lot of silver retraining and reskilling crews. And, and really, you know, you, you think about World of Tanks, you really could call it a world of crews because crews are the most important important asset that you have, especially you know once you've gotten enough upgrades on a tank that it's pretty functional, um, your crews really help it to perform. And so there are a few there are a few abilities that make a big difference in especially lights and mediums and TDs. Uh, and that aside from Sixth Sense, uh, one of the most influential things from a vision perspective is camo because you can double your camo value. Now notice where I'm looking. One of our tanks took a shot on the way in, and that's almost definitely the 907, the Unicum from Ujo on their team, probably over by the, the D6 area. The problem that I had here is I may have wanted to cro try to cross that gap, right? Because I was still lit by the enemies because I was spotted by that 907. And as a result, I ate a very damaging shell from that Scorpion G. Now, you know, the, the nice thing is, is I did get up to the top of the hill and you know, this was an area I think I was pinging the map asking for help in the beginning. Hill is really flexible on this map for a couple different reasons. The biggest reason is, aside from being able to potentially get flanking fire on any other tanks that are trying to enter Hill down by the E0 area, the other thing is that you have an incredibly flexible field of fire. You can fire in their tanks that are on the northeastern side of the map, you can fire tanks that are kind of around their spawn area, and then I can cover from here and shoot southwest toward tanks that are pushing our spawn. You'll see this later. Now this is one of those awkward situations where they have a lot of tank destroyers that are sort of camping the perimeter around the hill, right? And for the most part, aside from this gorilla, like their two Scorpion Gs that are in my frame currently are both trying to stay behind hardcover. And so what this typically means is that I may only be able to fire one shell at a time, maybe two at most. And so I've got to be really careful and selective about the shots that I'm going to take and try to get as much as possible that first shot advantage because what I don't want to do against the Scorpion G is trade one for one for him. His alpha is 490, mine is you know, 300, and even if I trade him for two for one, that's still only a 600 to 490 damage exchange, which is too close to that one for one ratio. You don't want to be trading damage you know, that much, especially in a squishy autoloader, because later in game games, if you need to be aggressive, because you have no armor, you have to assume that you're going to take damage. Now, this is what I mean about you know leveraging vision carefully. This rock in front of me has bushes on both sides, so I can try to move up here and see if I can get that first spot for shot advantage. And if I do get it, I'm most likely going to dip back after only firing one or maybe even two shells. And trying to squeeze out a third shell is going to likely expose me to too much risk. So here, for example, it's a perfect example. I get one shell onto that Scorpion G. Notice the other one immediately pokes out to try to take a shot on me. So you know you have to kind of anticipate those situations, engage your risk, and that's why this. There's a lot of tier 10 battles that I could have showed you, but in this one in particular is trying to show 
don't force the action you know in a squishy auto loader don't get greedy if you can only take one shot at a time and back up that's okay just don't eat damage in return now you can see we've really badly lost the one and two lanes it's partly because their heavies just you know outplayed ours significantly and then they also had help from the 907 who had flanked down from the middle part of the map so you know what i'm going to do now is i'm reloading and we're running it in a three tank deficit and we're in the process of getting encircled what is helping us is that none of their tanks have been willing to push up to easier to challenge us on hill you know while we're sitting on the crown of hill like this they're not going to be able to do meaningful damage to us unless one of our tanks is overexposing himself and trying to chase damage. Okay, so like I said, the hill's really powerful. You know, what I'm waiting for is to see if some of their heavies can get exposed here. Our Rheinmetall Borsig really should have just kept running. Um, you know, he's asking for help, but he kind of allowed himself to get pinned in. And so, you know, you're responsible for your own tank. If you're on a flank that is folding, you need to move far enough away that you can get to a position where you've got some workable hard, or, hard and soft cover and where they just can't move up and bully you like this IS-4 is. What I'd really love to do is take out this 907, but he's going to be very smart in conserving his remaining 300 plus hit points. And the 907, by the way, just it's a ridiculously strong tank, super strong front to hull armor profile. And notice I'm withholding my shot. I could take a shot on that IS-4, but instead I wait until he gives me a better one by over-rotating his hull. It really, you know, if, if he had been smart, he would have kept his tank uh, pointed towards me and back up a little bit but you know he wasn't respecting you know my gun enough and so I finished him off now you know before taking the third shot with my Lorraine 40T if I were in a single shot tank and I had that shot on his lower plate when he's pointed directly at me I'd probably go ahead and take it it's not a high percentage shot but you know might as well take it uh, but in this case because I am an auto loader I did wait until he gave me a little bit better shot and that it made, allowed me not only to get an easy kill shot on him on the side of his armor it allowed me to put another shell into that E75 and that those heavies to the south of the map really are a big danger to us in that you know if we let them encircle us and push toward the hill with high hit points they're just going to bully us okay so now here's the thing right like I, we, we have to do something we are losing really badly and R268 V4 decides to push in, and this is a really well-timed push because you can see all three tanks here at the bottom of the hill are really uh, very damaged. A couple of them are one-shots. The only tank that's going to be able to support them in the back is the Scorpion G that is over by B0 A0, but for whatever reason, like he really should have peeked out at this time because none of us are looking at him, and so to some extent, he kind of left his team out, uh, hung him out to dry, right? You can see our 268 V4 still hasn't taken a single point of damage. You know, it's been beaten to death, but this tank is wildly overpowered with a global win rate of over 57%. You know, so that's like eight percentage points over the average. And, you know, it's totally clear why that tank is so overpowered. It has an incredibly strong frontal armor profile coupled with incredible mobility. Generally speaking, tanks that have that much armor from the front um, either don't have a turret and or are slow or not agile. So the, the tank is very stupidly overpowered. You know, I've seen some comments from people um, who went to one of the developer gatherings or offsites and that Wargaming had said that they honestly thought the tank was going to be underpowered. Like, I, I don't know how you could look at a tank with a strong armor profile, strong mobility, and a turret and, like, rationally believe that that would be true. And then obviously, you know, as it's played out, uh, since again, the tank has been in the actual live game you know it's it's ridiculously overpowered now i, you know, I will say obviously um you, just having a 268 v4 on your team is not a guaranteed win you know they, they still need to play smartly you know i've seen plenty of terrible 268 v4 drivers um, one thing i should notice about this this scorpion g you might have noticed that there was a shell that fired and hit the rock uh just here right next to me that was our e5 so basically their scorpion g was pinned in in the ditch you can't push toward the e5 because e5 will kill him and if he tries to exit out of the ditch to the north well that's why i went where i went to hem him in now the next tank that we can take out here you always think think of like kind of collapsing edges it's the scorpion g and our t44 did a nice job of mostly being hauled down here because his turret's pretty strong and dropping that scorpion g into one shot territory and i have the hit points that i can now poke up and take a risk here and because I also have multiple shells in the clip I go ahead and snapshot if that shot had missed and he hit me then I would just drive up a little forward and take that second shot for the kill now the T44 I'm trying to tell him to stop like what he's doing right here is madness because I could see this coming a mile away their Unicom 907 the second he sees that the T44 like because we were both lit by the Scorpion G who dies 907 is going to push across that T44 cannot physically one shot him 
right? And the 907's got a fantastic armor profile. And the other thing, too, is that 907's paying attention. He probably knows I just killed those two scorpion Gs, which means that I only have two shells in my clip. And this is the part right here where I make a mistake. The bad terrain resistance and this dead body are slowing me down. So I had to think, oh, maybe I'll just stop here and see if I can track him when he comes around the corner. What I should have done is just kept running as much as possible because this 907 is hugging the wall. I never get a shot on his track to kind of track him. And at this point, once he's this close to me, um, you know, I'm he's wiggling and moving back and forth, and basically he's just bullying me. There's really, unless I get a penetrating shot through his uh, one of his cupolas, there's nothing there that I can do, right? And so you got to recognize situations when you're going to lose. RT44, for no good reason, pushed across the bridge and just gave himself up to 907. Now, if the T44 were patient and he and I worked together, we could have taken out that 907, but instead the T44 rushes forward at a bad time, gives the 907 to chained one versus one. So at a time when I wanted to reload and have the, those four shells just in case I got some bounces off the front of hull of the, the 907. But, you know, you got to really kind of think through these situations in real time and make good decisions. And the T-44, he played a solid game, but that was a mistake in what he did. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know about your comments or feedback around and questions around playing autoloaders. I know it's a very tough thing just like light tanks, but they are super rewarding. Hope you enjoyed the video. Take care.